Thanks, Rachelle, and good afternoon, everyone. And today we would you know, like to speak to you and give you an introduction about what is palliative care. So just a little bit of a background on you know, uh, what's the entire scope of the services that we, that we provide. So along with me are uh, present today the integral members of our team as well, Eve, as well as Mason. And essentially, you know, what we have tried to do is to provide a holistic care to um, approach individuals and families who are dealing with serious illnesses to provide them with, you know, with coordinated care. So we have palliative care services uh, in the hospital. We have also extended our services out in the community in office space settings, as well as some of the facilities, assisted livings and, uh, and skilled nursing facilities as well as we are going out to patients' homes also for patients who are unable to make it to, to the offices. So I wanted to start off by you know, giving you an overview of what palliative care is. And um, Eve, can you confirm that you are able to see my slide? That's good, okay, all right. So first and foremost, I wanted to begin with you know, what is palliative care? So in short, if I were to define palliative care, um, you know, it is specialized medical care that treats the symptoms and stress of a serious illness. It is an extra layer of support. And the goal is to improve the quality of life for patients as well as their families when they are dealing with serious illnesses. It is based on the needs of the patients and the family and not on a patient's prognosis. One thing that I wanted to you know, clarify here is that it's appropriate at any age, as well as at any stage of a serious illness. So just to keep, give you an example, let's say if somebody got diagnosed with a serious illness and they were pursuing you know, active treatments, palliative care can be provided along with their regular care that is going on and it doesn't mean that you know somebody will have to forego one kind of care to pursue another mode of treatment. So this can be continued side by side alongside while somebody is dealing with the stress and symptoms of a serious illness. So why palliative care? What is the importance of palliative care? Multiple studies have revealed that the American healthcare delivery system is not really well designed and well planned to meet the needs of patients and families who are living with serious illnesses. Our focus has been on disease specific treatments rather than looking at the whole person as well as their family. And this has resulted in suffering and fragmentation of care and often burdensome transitions from, you know, from the hospital to the nursing home, back to home, then back to the emergency department. So we're really not you know, designed to be able to take care of a serious illness in that state because the focus in the past has been mostly on, on acute care. Palliative care is that bridge which help connects the various parts and various entities and helps coordinate the care so that all of the unmet needs that a patient or family are going through while they're dealing with the stress of a serious illness, all of those can be met. And once those needs are, those needs are met, what does that do? That helps in improving the quality of life for not just the patients, but as well as their families as well. When, when individuals know what to expect and how can they plan for, that, for both the expected as well as the unexpected scenarios, they are better equipped to deal with any kind of stress or symptom that may be associated with, a, with, with their um, serious illness. So as I mentioned before, you know, palliative care is, does not mean that you know, this is something that you will have to forego in terms of pursuing your disease-directed standard treatment. So if, God forbid, somebody is you know, diagnosed with a metastatic cancer, while they are continuing their chemotherapy, while they're continuing their radiation, while they are undergoing surgery, palliative care can be offered. It's another extra layer of support that can be offered at the same time while they are undergoing their disease-directed specific treatments. 
So what are some of the things that are looked at when, you know, when palliative care gets involved? So first and foremost, more important is, you know, looking at the symptoms. So if you have uncontrolled symptoms like pain, nausea, vomiting, these are often certain things that are associated with, uh, with serious illnesses, shortness of breath. All of those can be, you know, can be addressed by involvement of, you know, palliative care teams by better coordination and, uh, and continuation of care. Not just the physical symptoms, the psychological symptoms also are, are also addressed. There may be cultural issues that a family or a patient may be experiencing that impact, you know, how they are perceiving their care or how they are dealing with the stress and stress and symptoms. By utilizing a multidisciplinary approach, you know, all of those issues or all of those challenges can be addressed as well. If there are any spiritual or religious or existential distresses that are, you know, that are affecting an individual or a family, tapping into the expertise of the multidisciplinary team can help address those challenges as well. We do come across circumstances where there may be determinations about, you know, the who's the legal or the surrogate decision maker that uh, that is involved in the case, or who is it that can make decisions. So all of those, you know, circumstances can also be dissected out with conversations um, with the patients as the as well as the families, and looking at if there is any, you know, advanced directive paperwork or any living bills and what is mentioned in all of those. So having a, you know, having a discussion with the patients and the families about those those are, those discussions are incorporated uh, into the conversations as well. If there are any social needs, and you know, you'll hear more about it from from Eve. If there are any social needs that are impacting or that are causing um, stress to, you know, to the already stressful uh, serious illness that an individual is experiencing, you know, the, the expertise of the multidisciplinary team can be tapped. And despite treatments and despite all of the interventions that have been done, if the disease still continues to progress, then appropriate care for end of life care and appropriate transitions to hospice can also be discussed. So looking at it really from a whole person philosophy and looking at not just the physical symptoms, but any other issues that may be further exacerbating the stress of a serious illness, all of those can be addressed by utilizing the expertise of the multidisciplinary team. So some common questions about palliative care, where can I receive palliative care? Palliative care can be provided in a variety of settings. It could be hospital, office-based settings, homes. Does insurance cover palliative care? Most insurance plans do, including Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, you know, if ever in doubt, please speak to the case manager or the social worker and they'll be able to, you know, help you out. And if you are under the care of somebody, let's say you're following up, you know, you're in the hospital or if you are in the office-based setting, the social worker or the case managers, you know, can help you um, find that piece of information out. Is palliative care right for me? Palliative care is good for, you know, anybody who's dealing with the stress and symptoms of a serious illness. And we'll go over the examples of uh, some of, some of the examples of what serious illnesses are. What can be expected from palliative care? Well, symptom management, coordinated care, helping out with transitions. So all of those things can be addressed by, by having the palliative care team be involved in your, in your care. Who provides palliative care? It's provided by a multidisciplinary team involving clinical providers, where you have physicians or nurse practitioners or physician assistants, you have social workers, you have chaplains, pastoral care. You have, in some cases, you may have volunteers. So it's really looking at you know, the whole person philosophy and providing that whole person care. How do I get palliative care? Please reach out to your providers if, and they will discuss it with you if you, know, you qualify or if you meet the criteria for referral to palliative care. Some of the referral criteria I've listed out here, but in a nutshell, the way to think about it is, you know, a serious illness, which is progressing. So if you have a new diagnosis of a serious illness, or if the ability to carry on activities of daily living is declining, 
along with the serious illness, if that's progressing, if your symptoms are uncontrolled, if there are any, any conflicts or uncertainty, uncertainties about which treatments to pursue or to not, then you know, can tap into the expertise of the palliative care team. If there are any questions about you know, advanced care planning, then absolutely, please reach out to your providers. Either they can discuss that with you or can refer you to a palliative care specialist. Some of the examples of serious illnesses, cancer with, you know, which is already spread, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, somebody who's requiring oxygens and is requiring multiple hospitalizations, that's signifying that you know, the disease, something is happening. Either the disease is progressing or some other complications are happening. So that needs to be, that needs to be looked into. If you have end-stage renal failure, not wanting to pursue dialysis, that's an appropriate referral for palliative care involvement. If you have advanced dementia, which is progressing, where it's coming down to a point where you're no longer able to, um, no longer able to take care of yourself, and you know feeding issues are arising, these are appropriate referrals to to palliative care. End-stage congestive heart failure, end-stage liver disease. If you have diabetes with severe complications, advancing ALS and COVID-19 with worsening disease, these are just a few few examples of the criteria or individuals who would benefit from a palliative care consultation. Just to give you an idea of how New Jersey um, translates in terms of like the availability of the resources, we have about three certified prescribing palliative care providers for 100,000 residents. There are about seven nursing home-based programs, 17 office-based programs, and 12 home-based programs. Most of the good news is that most of the hospitals do have some form of, you know, of palliative care services in the hospitals. The field is spreading out into the community, but it's just that it's taking time and there are, you know, there are challenges uh, that need to be overcome. What I can tell you is that a couple of years ago when it started, it only started with, with hospital-based services. But you know, now it's gradually advancing out into the into the community. Just a little uh, word about advanced care planning, what that means. Advanced care planning is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health in understanding and really sharing their values, what their goals are, and what their preferences are about future medical care. The goal of advanced care planning is to ensure that whatever medical care that is going to be provided it's going to be consistent with the values and goals of an individual. And so that, you know, unless we know, unless we ask, we would not know what an individual's uh, preferences are. So it's really, really important to have that conversation much ahead before we actually lose our capabilities to, you know, make those kinds of decisions. Some of the common documents that are often used are you know, you may have heard about advanced directives or living wills or post documents. Essentially, you know, they help you outline what your preferences would be in case untoward situations arose or irreversible conditions arose, or who would be the decision maker, who could be your voice or who could be your um, heart in case, you know, decisions had to be, had to be considered. So with that, I will pass it on to Eve. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Um, Dr. Sharma gave you a great overview um, of palliative care. And one of the things I like most about palliative care is the fact that it is a holistic approach. It looks at the patient as a whole, encompassing the physical, emotional, and spiritual. And we have different disciplines, as she said, to meet these needs, such as doctor, nurse practitioner, social worker, chaplain, integrative healing, and volunteers. And our roles overlap as patients talk about many aspects of themselves. Patients will discuss their spirituality or pain and symptoms or emotions with any of us. So no matter what our discipline may be, we address it all. At the same time, we each have our own specialties and expertise to bring to the table, and we refer to each other to best help meet patients' special needs. Um, 
Another unique part of palliative care is that it defines the patient as not just the person who is ill, but it includes their family or defined family as well. So when someone is sick, it, it impacts their loved ones tremendously. Thus, we often work with families to support them. You know, so sometimes my work specifically is just with the patient and other times it's with the patient and family, or at times it can be with just the family. My role isn't as clear as the doctor, or the nurse practitioner. You know, it varies with the needs of the individuals and the situation, but it often involves helping them cope in one way or another. Many people who are dealing with a significant illness can use an extra layer of support. They're dealing with understanding what is going on medically, adjusting to their illness, and needing to make decisions about their treatment and care. These things are difficult in the best of times, but harder when you're not feeling well. I start by trying to learn who they are and where they're at at this moment. What were they like before their illness? What was their job? What were their hobbies or passions? Who was important to them? Is this diagnosis new? And are they trying to absorb and deal with that? Or have they been dealing with it a long time and are worn down? What are their worries and fears? Are they worried about family members, children, finances, work, their body changes? You know, understanding them and where they're at helps me assess ways in which I can assist them to live their best life. In our work, the connection or relationship we form is a key aspect of helping and supporting them. When dealing with a significant illness, the impact can be profound. People grieve many things, starting with the loss of their everyday normal. It affects how they think about themselves and the way they connect to the world. It is valuable having someone who is objective, listen, acknowledge their feelings and be present. I, I do the same with patients' family members. I try to help them make sense of what is happening and help them cope. I also do a lot of work with parents, helping their children understand and deal with the effects of illness within the family. These are pieces of my work, but there are many others. You know, a few examples of my role are attending patient and family meetings with providers, asking doctors to clarify things when they're not clear to patients and families, helping with resources, doing relaxation exercises for stress reduction, encouraging life review, doing legacy work, advocating for the patient and family, grief counseling, or helping someone complete an advanced directive. And these are just a few. Every day is different and it, it's responding to needs. To try to help you understand better what I do, I just wanna share a few stories of people I've worked with. The first was a woman who was bed bound, had difficulty breathing and a lot of pain. She had a tracheostomy to breathe, so it was difficult for her to speak. So she often mouthed things. She had a prolonged stay in the hospital and her family worked, so she was alone a lot during weekdays. In the course of visiting and providing her with support, she expressed how she often couldn't get comfortable and rest. Her symptoms were difficult to manage due to sensitivities to medications. I asked her if she wanted me to do some guided imagery to help take herself away to a place she felt relaxed. She was open to try and really responded to this. I could see her body relax and she would drift to sleep. When visiting her after doing this several more times, she told me, when I'm tired, I'm able to close my eyes and sleep now. And this is because of you. She expressed that she could take herself away to this special place and it helped her. She told me how much she appreciated this. I was really moved by this because I knew how much she had suffered. And I was so happy that she had this tool to use to be able to find some relief and peace when she needed it. 
Another case was one where I worked with both the patient and the family. The patient had COVID and had had a prolonged hospital stay. Initially, my work was with the wife, who was frightened as the patient's situation was serious. The patient was in the ICU and had been on a ventilator. I called her with updates as she couldn't visit initially due to his COVID diagnosis. I helped her cope and was a consistent support while the patient had his ups and downs. As the patient started to improve and could engage, my work involved helping him cope with his changes and losses and encouraging him to have patience with himself in his healing process. I would help the patient find positive things to focus on. I would advocate for him and remain to constant support. Both the patient and his wife felt that the support made a big difference during his hospital stay. And when he was being discharged, he told me he was really going to miss me. I hope these patient experiences give you a picture of this work. It's hard to relay the true essence of these moments as it's difficult to capture the intensity of them in words. This is a time of crisis for our patients and families. Sometimes it's the small things we do or being present that makes the difference. There's the expression, you can't always control what happens, but you can control how you react. So when people are faced with adversity, we try and help them make meaning out of it, to think about what is important to them, and to maximize their quality of life. Um, and I'm going to pass this along now to Mason. Okay. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Dr. Sharma. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I can see there's a bunch of people on the line and, you know, we we feel, I think you can tell that we feel really strongly. This is just, a, it's a great service that we provide to people. And, you know, a lot of times uh, people become ill and the, the process of becoming a patient can feel dehumanizing uh, as you sort of get reduced down to a, an illness or a, or a diagnosis. And as a spiritual care provider, I love being part of this team because we really recognize the sacredness of the whole person. Um, you hear Eve talking about the family, talking about the various needs people have to feel supported. You, feel, you hear Dr. Sharma talking about the whole spectrum of care that we provide, trying to determine what's most important for people. So it's... Um, you know, we really try to get to know people, get to know what's important to you. Um, to me, that's one of like the fundamental questions that we all as palliative care practitioners are asking is what's, what's most important to you? For some people, you know, and it depends on the day, it depends on the person, it depends on the illness. So, you know, for some people, they're going to have pain and discomfort that is like keeping them from doing anything in their life. So they really need some medical management. Um, for other people, you know, their relationships are strained, their self identity is being impacted by the illness or by, you know, things that they, they're no longer able to do. Um, you know, for me as a spiritual care provider, I want to, I want to know about what gives your life meaning, what, what gives you purpose, what helps you to feel a sense of transcendence in your life. Uh, it's not just about what's your religion, what church do you go to? It's about, you know, what's really most fundamentally important to who you are and to what, what gives your life value. Um, so for some people, that's a, that's a connection to a God or to a, a deity of some kind. Um, you know, for other people, it's a connection to a, a social community. Uh, it's for so many of us, our relationship to our family is really fundamental to who we are, which is why it's so important for this service that we're, we're tapping into who you are in the midst of your family and how can we support your family and how can we help you as a family make a decision. So often, you know, we as a culture value autonomy, we want, we want the individual to make all the decisions for themselves. But when it really comes down to it, we see that so many people make their decisions in 
concert with their family. It's a whole unit that needs to feel comfortable moving forward uh, with whatever the decision is, whatever the course of treatment is. Um, you know, other things I'm thinking of as a spiritual care provider, you know, what is it that helps you to feel cared for, to feel loved, to feel connected? Um, so those are questions that, you know, this is a, there's a lot of overlap between Eve and myself, you know, so that we're both looking at sort of the social fabric of what gives people's lives meaning. Um, and so the wonderful thing about a team is that uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes people don't, you know, they don't connect to me because I'm a religious professional and they, they grew up in a, you know, strict Catholic household that didn't make them feel better or whatever the, whatever the case may be. Some people don't want to talk to a religious professional. I um, mean, and so I'm like, all right, let me, let me have Eve go in and, and meet these people and offer support. On the other hand, some people might feel like there's some kind of stigma about talking to a social worker. It's like a mental health professional. And so in that case, you know, you might have me go in and, and see what's going on. Um, you know, a couple of things that I think that are important for us to think about is how does the care we provide support us as individuals and in our whole personhood, right? So an example from my life is that recently I, I tore a meniscus in my knee. And it seems like a small thing, right? Um, but I'm, you know, I'm relatively young. I've got a young family. I've got an active lifestyle. And having this, this small injury in my knee has just changed like every single decision I make about like what I do with my day, the logistics of, of caring for my children, the things I do to care for myself, the exercise, how I feel about myself, whether, you know, because of how productive I can be in my day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, and so this, this small thing that's, you know, it's a really straightforward thing that a lot of people have, it has impacted me on like all these different levels. And that's just a little thing. So imagine, you know, you have a, a more serious diagnosis, how much that impacts your sense of like who you are as a person, how your relationships are affected. Um, we just can't underestimate how, and we don't even know how something's going to affect us. We try to anticipate, we try to get the best doctor to be you know, the best specialist. And we've got them here, they're in the city, they're here at Valley. Um, but so often what we need isn't necessarily the best specialist, but we need people who are gonna listen to how our illness is affecting us uh, and what's most important to us. A um, couple of examples of people that I've cared for um, and seen like needs that I'm particularly able to meet as a spiritual care provider on the palliative care team. Um, I had a patient some years ago who had complicated illness and had been in the hospital for a long time and was going to be, you know, going home, uh, transitioning to hospice. So we've been working on all that. Um, and we had established a great rapport, a very friendly rapport while she was in the hospital. And before she left the hospital, it was really important to her to offer to provide me with a meal. And at first I'm like, okay, what, why are we, what, what's the deal? Why are we doing this? Um, but it became clear that like, as her, her husband picked up this food and she changed out of her, her hospital gown and put on some regular clothes and they brought like a little paper cloth to put over her bedside table that like being able to provide hospitality uh, to somebody was like a really fundamental part of who this person was. And she didn't want to just be the recipient of care. She also wanted to, to give back. Uh, so there's this like reciprocity and relationship in the care that we provided to this woman. And we had this like really, uh, she, you know, we had this meal together and like that was really important to her. Another patient I had had, you know, these really complex GI symptoms that were causing her lots of pain and discomfort. Um, and her, religious leader had the belief that this was somehow her fault, that she um, 
because of something she had done, she was, she was reaping the, the, the repercussions of that difficulty. And so not only was she having this difficult physical symptom, she was also experiencing this um, mental anguish on top of that, uncertain about whether she had done something to cause this, really quite sure that she hadn't. Um, and so I was, you know, from a different religious tradition from this person, but being able to hear her difficulties, hear about her relationship to her religious community, and to, you know, from my perspective, tell her that I, I didn't believe that she had done anything wrong. Uh, her suffering was not a, a punishment for something in her life, that uh, illness comes upon people, you know, whether we deserve it or not. Um, and that was able to provide like a great deal of relief for her uh, to hear that from, from a religious professional. Um, you know, so as I, as I kind of wrap up this, this portion, I just wanna, I hope that you can see from us that we really bring our whole humanity to this work that we do. And we really try to lift up what's human in each person that we're working with and the family. And, you know, part of the reason we do this is because there's some stigma about palliative care and about getting this service and it's scary to people. And we just wanna just break that down and let people know like there is just, it's a net gain to have these supports in place. Nobody, you know, we're not rushing people along. We're not, you know, moving people out. We're like, helping people get what's connected to what's most important to them. We're helping you uh, align your goals with your care. We're trying to lift up what's important and just support you um, from whichever angle is most important for you. Um, and we're all sort of specially trained in like communicating, communicating with you. Uh, which is, I think, really sets us apart from, uh, you know, a lot of other medical specialties that like the doctors, the social worker, myself, like we're all trained in communication and listening. Um, and so often our, our medical system doesn't, it doesn't, we don't listen that well to people. We do a lot of tests and we get a lot of numbers, um, but sometimes the, the person ends up feeling left out of the equation in that. And so that's where we really try to lift up the person uh, you know, recognize that we're sacred individuals and that we try to care for the whole, the whole thing. So that's kind of it for my part. Um, I, Rochelle, are you going to help to walk us through the Q and A? Are we getting Q and A, or do you want us to? Um... Yes, yes. Before we thank you, thank you, Mason, Eve, and Dr. Sharma. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, reinforce for the attendees just to remind everyone that this is part one of our conversation series it's a how-to series for living your best life amidst illness so we do invite you to attend the other two uh, presentations uh, the second one will be on May 12th and the third one is on May 19th so uh, please register for that if you haven't done so it's the same way that you registered for this particular um, event. It's you can call 1-800-VALLEY-1 or go to valleyhealth.com slash events. All right. So um, for the question, so what are some of the barriers for, you know, um, either you, either um, Dr. Sharma, maybe you encounter different things. What are some of the barriers that you hear from patients why they don't come out and um, look for or reach out for palliative care. So I can um, go first and then the other team members uh, can chime in. So, you know, the first and the foremost barrier is perhaps lack of awareness of the benefits that palliative care can add. Oftentimes what happens is that, you know, when people hear the word palliative care, it's like, you know, oh, uh, you know, I'm not there yet, or, you know, why is it for me? Or, you know, it, it doesn't make sense because I'm continuing my, you know, my regular disease directed care. So the first and foremost understanding, the first barrier is, uh, you know, not knowing the benefits that this service can bring. 
as was uh, mentioned by Eve, as well as Mason, you know, palliative care is an extra oh. level of support that can truly augment, you know, the additional disease directed therapies that you're getting and help you cope better with the stress and symptom of the of the illness that you are experiencing and not just you you know the family as a whole it's you know when somebody is suffering from an illness it's not just the that particular individual it's the caregivers around them also who are in that same journey so that's number you know number 1 additional uh, challenges or barriers that we see out there are that there is not, you know, a whole lot of enough people out there to be able to provide this kind of services. If you look at it, you know, yes, you know, hospitals in general have done a really good job in terms of having some sort of palliative services in the hospital setting, but there's not a whole lot of resources out there in community-based settings. So, you know, there's a lack of, you know, lack of trained people out there. So, you know, those are the two major uh, barriers that, you know, that I foresee. One is the lack of awareness of the benefit. And then number two is not, even if you realize the benefit, you know, not having enough people who can provide those kind of like services and skills in the setting that you would, you know, that you would optimally uh, need. Eve, Mason, would you want to add Anything more to that? I'm gonna add, you know, sometimes I'll go into a room to introduce myself and I'll say, hi, my name's Mason, I'm the chaplain. And immediately people are like, whoa, whoa, who called the chaplain? We're not, we don't, we're not, I'm not dying here. What is this? And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Um, and it's, you know, it's similar with palliative care. It's like, yeah, maybe there's, I, I do, I do pray with dying people. I support grieving families. That's part of what we do as palliative care, but how much better to have a relationship well in advance of that, that time, right? So when I come into a room and somebody has that, that, that sense, I'm, I try to say, okay, well, I support people at all different points in the, in their illness. Here you are in the hospital. I know it's difficult for people to be in the hospital. So, you know, just here to offer support and see how things are going. Um, you know, so I think there's, there's that presupposition that like, it's a, it's a really bad sign when palliative care gets involved. And we just, that's just not true. It's just a extra layer of support for any, any complicated illness. Yeah, I mean, I I would add the same thing. I mean, the same thing happens that I've walked. I walked into a room recently, and they said, "Oh, you were called. That must that must mean something." And I explained, just as Mason and and Dr. Sharma explained that, you know, that people have this impression of what it is. Um, but I think just to add one more layer is a lot of it is not just you know patients and families not understanding it's it comes from higher above a lot of physicians who would refer to palliative care don't because they think they don't understand the value of it so that's that's a challenge as well because they feel like oh they're not ready for palliative care yet because they're they're in active treatment and not realizing you know that it can happen side by side so you know Another analogy that I would like to add here is, you know, when, let's say, when we get into the unknown of something, and if there is somebody who's there to walk by us side by side, that journey becomes less stressful. Mm -hmm. So if I did not know anything about, you know, let's say if I was gonna go on a, on a mountain hike, and I had no idea about what kind of preparation is going to be needed. If there was somebody who could tell me, who could prepare me, or who, more importantly, who could walk with me, that would become, that experience would become much more palatable. And that experience would become much more absorbable instead of like just dealing out with it just on my, on my own. So it's a, you know, different angle of looking at it but you know again it's an extra layer of support to walk through with individuals and their families during those stressful times thank you 
We do have a question about, um, is palliative care provided to patients in nursing homes? And I guess if it is, how do they access it? Yes, palliative care can be provided to patients in um, nursing homes. The, you know, the best way of getting that is to speak to the, uh, the people or the personnel at nursing homes to find out what kind of resources that they may have. Having said that, you know, even though the services can be provided, some of the nursing homes may or may not have integrated those services into their overall, you know, offerings. So important to, you know, important to speak to the, to the nursing home personnel and ask them how they can access palliative care. Thank you. Are, um, there's another question. Are these services available, palliative care services, available to people who have been in a different hospital and now at home? Does the illness need to be very serious or potentially serious? Individuals who are dealing with you know, serious illnesses or if their illness is progressing, those are the people who would benefit from palliative care. To give you an example of a differentiation, for example, you know, let's say if you just have an asthma exacerbation and you were not doing, you know, well, you needed hospitalization and things like that. In those cases, palliative care would not really be, you know, indicated for that sense. But now that you have, let's say, now you have COPD and, you know, you are experiencing recurrent hospitalizations and your functional capacity is declining. So yes, then you, you know, that in those cases, palliative care is, is indicated. And yes, if you are at home, uh, you know, again, it doesn't matter where your location is. What matters is, you know, whether you have a serious illness, which is, you know, which is progressing. And if you are symptomatic, and helping address with those, you know, with those symptoms as well as the stress. And just to, um, it doesn't matter what hospital you've been in, um, you can you can get palliative care services. Um, it can be referred to you. Um, you know, we are one of the only ones in Bergen County. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, you know, so but we only cover is it Bergen and Passaic? Yes, we cover point. Bergen and Passaic, and we are one of the few um, few systems who actually offer the entire continuum of inpatient, office-based, some of the facilities, not all, and home-based visits for people who are homebound, right. who are not so able to make it to the offices. So you can have come from any hospital and any yes. hospital can refer you to get palliative care. And, and depending on where you live, if you don't live, you know, within Bergen or Passaic County, you know, there may be palliative care in your area. You just have to, you know. Ask require. your provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. A referral is going to be needed. So speak to your, speak to your doctor or your provider and, uh, you know, they can, First, determine if you are, you know, you will, your needs will be served by palliative care, and then they can make a referral. I guess the other follow up question to that is if, as mentioned by Eve before, with some providers not being aware of what palliative services can offer, what if um, the patients or their families are hitting? a roadblock that way with their own provider? Is there a number or a center they can call or where can they, or where else can they inquire? So if you are not able to, let's say, you know, you, you think that you need services and if your primary care provider does not think that, you know, you need those services, I mean, you can call our, you know, our main line and we would be able to, you know, help you out with, with that. We can provide, Rishal, we have our, you know, contact information mm -hmm. on the brochures, so we can help address that question, but a referral is going to be, you know, is going to be needed. Okay. Uh, another question we have is, um, how, what advice would you give to family members who's, um, who has, parents, for example, or family members who they think would benefit from palliative care, but are 
hesitant? Um, like, how would they go about that? If their own, like their own parents are not open to palliative care, for example. You know, it's, that's a very hard, you know, because people have the right to, you know, self-determine, you know, they make their own choices, but it could be, you know, about, you know, bringing someone, you know, to talk to them, to explain, you know, a lot of times they don't want it because they don't understand the value of it, but sometimes people are very private and, you know, we often get people who don't want a lot of people coming into their home or they don't want a lot of additional, um, traffic, you know, at home. So, you know, education is, is, is a way, you know, to help like having one of us speak, you know, someone and give them information about it, but you, you can't force it or you can't push it, but, um, you know, that would be the best way, you know, you know, another resource that exists out there is, uh, to kind of like help break that ice is, uh, you know, resources that are offered by the Conversation Project. So, you know, they offer, you know, some kind, some kinds of tools and tips as to how to break the ice and have those tough conversations with your, with your loved ones. Perfect. And I just want to make sure everybody saw, just to go back to the last question, um, the, it was put in the chat, uh, a link to getpalliativecare.org. So that's a way to find a local provider you know, to look for programs close to you. Perfect. The other thing I would say too is, you know, as people age and as, you know, illness becomes a bigger part of the picture, you know, they, people still want to maintain their independence and their volition. I know I've experienced this with my parents that they are not prepared to have their children taking care of them yet, right? And I think a lot of older folks feel that way. And so we've had to... Um, you know, tread, tread lightly to let, recognize that they're still able to make their own decisions, even though we would like them to be making some different decisions than they are. Um, and just to remember, like the approach that we take is it's a conversation, right? We're not, we're not coming in to force you to do something. You know, we want to know what's most important to you. And so I think that's, that's the question is what's, what's really important to you? Do you want to maintain your independence in, in this way and that way? And how can we best make that possible? Um, my, my parents have a friend who's, who's been increasingly incapacitated and you know, homebound and now she's in a facility. And my parents talk a lot about how they don't want to have happen what's happened to this friend of theirs. And you can see that they're reflecting on their own, uh, you know, their own mortality, their own lives through the lens of their friends. So, you know, I've been trying to talk to them about what they're saying in those ways. It's just as like a, a conversation, not, not have them feel like I'm, we're coming in to tell them how it's got to be. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be forced into anything. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Was there any um, other messages, any takeaway uh, messages you want to give to our attendees? So, you know, what I'd like to say here is that Yes, you cannot plan for everything. I wish we could, but you know, there is no way that we can plan for every single scenario. Um, nobody has a crystal ball with which they can say, you know, this is going to happen. And if this happens, this is what I would want or this is what I would not want. But what we can do is, you know, have a conversation with our loved ones as to what is the most important thing that matters to us should uncertainties arise in the future ever. And not only is that, you know, is that a boon for yourself in the sense that, you know, it ensures that your, your wishes are at least heard and hopefully those wishes would be, you know, would be carried out. But it's a big relief on your, you know, on your loved ones as well. Because yes, these conversations are hard. And imagine if decisions have to be made when these conversations have never happened as to what matters to you the most, what's the most important thing that you would want for, for, for yourself. It becomes so much on, on, the, on the loved ones as well. So having those conversations is, is one of the, you know, one of the 
I would say, you know, a big gift that you can, you know, that you can undertake with your, with your loved ones so that, you know, they're not making those decisions if ever that need arises alone. They are making those decisions based on choices and preferences that have been expressed by you because they are going to be your ears and your heart and your eyes if you were in a situation where you were not able to make those decisions. Thank 